Sure. So I think the the overall job market it's it's definitely cooled、um, compared to where we were coming in you know a year ago, two years ago, and so that's why we're seeing those job gains much more concentrated, and we're seeing a lot of different、uh, metrics for the labor labor market have have come back. You're listening to IBKR podcasts. Find more conversations at ibkrpodcasts.com. Please remember, any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to IBKR Podcasts. I'm your host Jeff Praisman, and it's my pleasure to welcome back to the IBKR Podcast Studio, Michael Normile, Nasdaq's U.S. economist. Welcome, Michael. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be here.、Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you in the studio for our monthly podcast. You and I, we've covered so many interesting economic topics, and today is no exception, as we're going to discuss the labor market. I kind of want to just, as we're beginning 2024, I'd like to recap 2023,、um, 2023's job market. Overall, the job market and the broader economy were expected to slow down. You know, due to the Fed's aggressive interest rate hiking. However, it seems because of possibly strong consumer spending and an increase in available worker labor shortages, it actually receded a little bit. Is this across all industries, or is it just concentrated in a few? 2023's job market turned out to be much better, much better than expected coming into last year, where a lot of people were expecting recession, which would have ultimately seen job losses. And so instead, we ended up adding 2.7 million jobs in in 2023. But somewhat surprisingly, even though we added 2.7 million jobs, the unemployment rate actually increased from 3.4 percent at the start of 2023 to 3.7 percent by the end of the year, and that has to do, like you said, with more people joining the labor force, and that was so. That's because we had more people joining the labor force than we gained jobs, and that's why we saw the unemployment rate increase. And so there, were, there are two main drivers of this increase in labor supply. Number one is increased immigration. And the second is the return of prime age workers, and so with the foreign-born share of the labor force, we saw that increase by 1.5 million people last year, and for prime age or ages 25 to 54, it increased by 1.7 million. And so for immigration, this was driven by an easing in immigration backlogs that had built up、uh, in the last few years, and for prime age workers, it was helped by increased workplace、uh, flexibility, which enabled more women to join or rejoin the labor force. Along with strong wage growth, which drew people back into the labor market, and so we can't exactly say if these gains were in specific sectors, but based on where we saw the job gains, you'd have to think a lot of them ended up in those sectors where we got the most job gains. And specifically, 80% of job gains job gains in 2023 were in just three sectors: education, healthcare, government. And leisure and hospitality. So that's actually really interesting. That more jobs created, but then more people wanting to enter that job force. So sort of like kind of rising tide lifts all all waters, I guess, right? Like, what do you think led to the increase of those of these industries? And and I know we're really early in 2024, but you know how are they faring so far? Well, so the interesting thing is that these those three sectors that I mentioned: education and healthcare, government, and leisure and hospitality. They're mostly non-cyclical, especially really education, healthcare, and government, and so that means that the state of the economy doesn't really govern their hiring and firing as much. So, for example, healthcare is more driven by the population aging, and then the government, of course, it's not profit-driven, so its hiring isn't tied to profitability in the same way it would be for a regular business. But we've seen with all three of these sectors is also its catch-up hiring from COVID. Healthcare and leisure and hospitality were among the hardest-hit sectors from COVID. And then government had a hard time hiring too, with less wage flexibility than private companies. So when we saw really strong wage growth, the government couldn't quite compete with that, those higher wages, and they, you know, had、uh, missed out on hiring people. And so there's some catch up from that. I suspect that secular trends will keep driving healthcare and government hiring,、uh, but as leisure and hospitality gets closer to its kind of pre-COVID trend, cyclical dynamics should take over there, and I think that also applies to the broader、uh, job market too. Besides for those sectors, like the overall, how the overall labor market is currently doing, you know, how how is it tracked? Sure. So I think the the overall job market it's it's definitely cooled、um, compared to where we were coming in, you know, a year ago, two years ago. And so that's why we're seeing those job gains much more concentrated, and we're seeing a lot of different、uh, metrics for the labor labor market have have come back. Some are back to kind of 2018, 2019 levels at this point. But so the, the, we've seen a, a broad slowdown in hiring. 
but still seeing job gains and they're pretty solid even compared to pre-COVID years. But in terms of how the labor market is tracked, there's really two surveys that are used. We have the establishment survey, which is a survey of businesses and the household survey, which of course is a survey of households. Uh, so the establishment survey, it's got a much larger sample and it gives us a bit more confidence in their numbers. Uh, and that provides the, the non-farm payroll numbers that we see reported in the news. The household survey gives us the unemployment rate. So the, even though the household survey does include you know, job gains numbers, the job gains that we see reported in the news are actually from the establishment survey. And then the unemployment rate that we see in the news is from the household survey. What are the economists forecasting for 2024 as far as wage growth and savings? So I know everything seems interconnected with the economy and everything seems to kind of have an effect on it's each other almost. So kind of curious for that very specific thing we're talking about today, like just, you know, just for wage growth and savings. I think wage growth is expected to cool this year. It's uh, in response to those signs that the labor market is cooling. For example, if you look at the quits rate, which it's the share of people quitting their jobs in a month out of all people that are employed, that's fallen from a high of 3% down to 2.2% which is back to the lowest readings it's had since uh, 2018, if you exclude the pandemic. And this is seen as a sign that people have less confidence in the labor market. Essentially, you're not gonna quit your job unless you're confident that you can quit and find a new job pretty quickly, right? And so it tends to be a leading indicator of wage growth. And so right now it's pointing to wage growth slowing to about three and a half percent in year over year terms over the next six months or so down from you know the four and a half percent range now. But importantly, even if we see wage growth slow, but inflation slows faster, then we'll see positive real wage growth. And I think that's what we're expecting this year. So that should help support spending and also improve savings as well. So overall, even if the wage growth is slowing, but as you said, the inflation growth is slowing as well, then would you say the labor market may slow then because of this, but economic growth may continue to kind of build on itself? Sort of an accurate statement as far as what, what may happen? Yeah, I think that's a fair fair way to put it. I don't expect us to see a strong revival in the economy or the labor market this year. I'm expecting more that we see solid real wage growth that does enough to support spending and keep the labor market kind of chugging along and the economy too. But I expect that economic growth will be a bit weaker than it was last year as the economy, it's in kind of a post-COVID normalization phase right now. And so I think that kind of continues this year where we get back to more kind of normal numbers that we had seen prior to the pandemic. Is there a risk um, to inflation with all these potential changes that might be you know, coming across between the end of 2023 and, and 2024? I'm, I'm personally not too concerned what these changes mean for inflation because of course, slowing wage growth will help bring down super core inflation. That's the you know, popular term for core services, excluding housing. And that, that category of inflation, it's mostly wage driven. And that's the one that the Fed has been particularly focused on because wages can be kind of quote unquote sticky in the sense that they don't adjust very quickly. But I think the, the upside risk to inflation that we really see, it's more from geopolitical kind of risks that we've been seeing with the recent attacks on ships in the Red Sea. We've seen shipping costs double between late November to now, and then oil prices were pushed up as well. And so those kinds of costs can get passed through to all sorts of different types of prices. But even still, I suspect that that effect will be you know, relatively modest. Over the past few years, you know, we keep hearing about the dangers of recession. And for many of us non-economists, it's really the first time we've heard mention of the SOM rule recession indicator. What exactly is that? And you know, how is it calculated and what does it signify? Yeah, so the SOM rule, it's an unemployment-based measure that has a track record of signaling recessions in the past. And so basically it states that if the three month moving average of the unemployment rate increases 0.5 percentage points above its low over the last year, then that signals a recession, either you know, we're in a recession or one's about to happen. So it's it's a bit wonky where we're looking at, you know, moving averages half a percentage point relative to the low over that also kind of one year window that's also moving. But right now it's at 0.2, so well below that half a percentage point uh, recession threshold. And importantly, even Claudia Sam herself has emphasized that reaching this threshold does not guarantee a recession. It's just something that has worked historically. Uh, you know, Michael, this was great. Are there any other thoughts you'd like to leave uh, our listeners with on the labor market? In the near term, the labor market, it's it's doing pretty well. It's it's still pretty tight by a lot of metrics. So we're still undergoing that process of normalization that I was talking about earlier, which will will take some time. And I think the longer term issue, though, that, that we'll have to see, it's it may be some of the labor shortages that we've seen since COVID may still linger as the population ages. And so 
what we have to think about is how to address that. And, and really that means two, two options. We can increase labor participation um, or we can increase labor productivity. And so in terms of labor force participation, that's probably some policy prescription that you know maybe induces more people to join the labor force. And then for productivity, a lot of people, of course, their go-to solution is AI. So, you know, we'll see what happens with that. You know, it's it's a it's a challenge because the demographics are kind of set in stone uh, for a long time. <laughs> but uh, we'll see how it plays out, and and that will ultimately have implications for wages and inflation, which will then impact monetary policy. But that's that's more of a longer term kind of concern. Uh, well, Michael, once again, I want to thank you for coming by and joining us at the IBKR Podcast Studio. For more from Michael and Nasdaq, go under Education to View previous Nasdaq webinars as well as our previous podcast with Michael. Thank you again for listening. Until next time, I'm Jeff Praise with Interactive Brokers. Thanks for listening to IBKR Podcasts. As always, we have more episodes at ibkrpodcasts.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education material, such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, financial and economic commentary at tradersinsight.news market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry, or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. The material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and is necessary, seek professional advice.